two, one, ignition and liftoff. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. It was called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, a new independent agency created by President Woodrow Wilson in 1915. Its job, make the United States a world leader in the field of aeronautics. In less than three decades, these early pioneers in aviation and those who followed would be called upon to think through problems a million miles away and do it with boldness and vision. By the mid-1950s, NACA had modern wind tunnels and was moving into the area of rocket and satellite research. Then on October 7th, 1957, the U.S. and the rest of the world were greeted by the sounds of Sputnik 1. The Soviet Union had placed the first artificial satellite into orbit. It would not be until early the following year that America's satellite, Explorer 1, successfully orbited the Earth and discovered a dense belt of radiation surrounding our planet. Who would have believed at this early stage that we would one day move outward from the thin ribbon of Earth's atmosphere to the very edge of our solar system and beyond? Project Mercury, the country's first manned spaceflight program, was given the go-ahead just one week after NASA was formed on October 1st, 1958. Seven test pilots were selected to become astronauts. Donald K. Deke Slate. Alan B. Shepard. Walter M. Shira. Virgil I. Gus Grissom. John H. Glenn, Jr. Leroy Gordon Cooper. And Malcolm Scott Carpenter. The seven new astronauts spent months and months undergoing rigorous testing and training. Several monkeys took check rides in the new Mercury spacecraft. the orbiting of unmanned satellites became more and more commonplace. And weather watchers like Tyros found a permanent place in our daily lives by improving weather forecasting capabilities.
On August 12, 1960, President Eisenhower took part in the first transmission of the Echo-1 communications satellite. On May 5, 1961, astronaut Alan B. Shepard made America's first suborbital flight. Project Mercury was underway. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading it loud and clear. This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go. 1.2 G. Cabin at 14 PSI. Oxygen is go. Soon after Freedom 7 landed, President John Kennedy gave NASA an ambitious new space goal. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win, and the others too. After Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom's test flights, four other American astronauts orbited the Earth in Mercury spacecraft, starting with John Glenn. He was followed by Scott Carpenter, Wally Sherrod, and Gordon Cooper. NASA geared up to respond to the lunar commitment, it became clear that new management techniques for handling far-flung systems manufacture and final integration would have to be developed. Clear also was the fact that state-of-the-art electronics and computers would be pushed to the limit. Unknowns about the moon were numerous. Such things as whether an astronaut would sink into dust over his head were a real concern. Lunar impact studies like these were carried out in an attempt to learn. Researchers fired projectiles simulating meteors hitting the moon into sand-like and rocky materials and then measured how much material was thrown out by the impact. This animation shows how scientists believe the huge crater Tycho was formed on the moon, a crater 54 miles wide. A series of picture-taking Ranger spacecraft slammed into the moon. Then, five lunar orbiters photographed over 90% of the moon's surface, including the never-before-seen backside. We saw a glimpse, too, of our own planet from lunar distance. But most important of all, it made possible the selection of landing sites.
six Surveyor spacecraft made soft landings on the moon over a two-year period. A robot arm dug a trench. Lunar soil was like wet sand. Men and equipment could safely land there. Panoramic views like these were assembled from hundreds of individual photographs. Communications via satellite exploded into a whole new industry. That first live intercontinental transmission by Telstar 1 was just the start. La Relay, designed to transmit television, telephone, and high-speed data. Syncom, with Olympic coverage from Tokyo, and Early Bird 1, all were follow-ons to previous research and development. Since rendezvous, docking, and having astronauts work outside the spacecraft were critical to lunar missions, NASA began Project Gemini. Using the Mercury capsule as a model, the Gemini spacecraft was enlarged to hold a two-man crew. Gemini would provide design answers for the upcoming Project Apollo. And who could ever forget that spectacular first walk in space made by astronaut Ed White? Ten times, pairs of astronauts flew into orbit, walking in space, rendezvousing and docking. Gemini had blazed a trail for Project Apollo, the three-man spacecraft that would carry astronauts to the moon. into designing, building, testing, and preparing astronauts, rockets, and spacecraft for the first lunar landing. Here's a visual look back at some of that preparation. In 1967, tragedy struck. 
the nation mourned the loss of the crew that would have flown the Apollo spacecraft on its maiden voyage. Astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee died in a flash fire as they were conducting pre-flight tests on the launch pad. The manned flight schedule was delayed 18 months as the command module underwent redesign. While these changes were being made, the parts and pieces needed to assemble the giant Saturn V moon rocket came together at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Everything associated with the Saturn V was huge. The rocket itself, the building where it was assembled, and the crawler transporter that carried it to the launch pad. The fully loaded Apollo Saturn V was 363 feet tall. Its main engines alone generated 160 million horsepower, and its fuel pumps pushed fuel to the engines with a force of 30 diesel locomotives. As Saturn V lifted off Launch Complex 39 for the first time, it weighed more than 2,800 tons. quickened. Starting with Apollo 8, every Saturn V launched had a three-man crew. Two days before Christmas in 1968, astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders became the first humans to pass out of Earth's gravitational control and into that of another body in the solar system, the moon. The hardware to travel to the moon had worked well, and landing sites looked good. Our Earth seemed small and fragile, hanging in the vastness of space. This view of ourselves from lunar distance would change the way we think about Earth for all time. It raised profound questions, especially those associated with the Earth's finiteness and unlimited resources. The next two flights, Apollos 9 and 10, would continue dress rehearsals for the first lunar landing. All systems were indeed ready. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin, and Michael Collins would make the historic journey. Next stop, Tranquility Base. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Contact 
and around the world, the Apollo 11 crew were welcomed back as heroes. More than 100 scientists from here and abroad began intensive studies of the lunar samples. Before Project Apollo ended, six additional flights to the moon were made, and all but one were highly successful. begin living in the orbiting laboratory. Those crews would stay 28, 59, and 84 days respectively. One of the major objectives was to find out if astronauts could physically withstand extended stays in space and continue to do useful work there. The answer was a resounding yes. Experiments in astronomy Earth resources observations, materials processing, and crystal growth all proved highly successful. Then ASTP, Apollo Soyuz Test Project, a joint endeavor between the Soviet Union and the United States. The mission called for a mutual docking and crew exchange to develop the necessary equipment for international space rescues. The years of research and development would now be put to the ultimate test. 
the first flight into space of Shuttle Columbia with astronauts at the controls. There was an air of excitement as the brand new shuttle moved from its processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center to the vehicle assembly building where it would be mated with rockets and fuel tank and rolled out to the launch pad. Never before had a new spacecraft been flown this way. Previous Mercury, Gemini, and Apollos were man-rated in advance, meaning that unmanned flights were flown before putting an astronaut crew on board. Despite nagging problems with engines and protective tiles, there was a quiet optimism. Longtime space workers knew from past experience with the lunar landing program that design and engineering problems do get worked out. After one false start, astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen headed for the launch pad. Thirty seconds. And that goes into the interior, and the astronauts are. Columbia's maiden flight would be brief, just 54 and a half hours, 36 orbits, and return to Earth. But it signaled the beginning of a reusable space transportation system. That everything is in the proper minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. We've gone from eight inches start. We have eight inches. later, after Columbia had been returned to the Kennedy Space Center, cleaned, refurbished, and rolled out to the pad, astronauts Joe Engel and Dick Truly flew Columbia into space again. While an imaging radar system mapped distant Earth, the crew made a critical test of a Canadian-developed mechanical arm that would later place payloads into and out of orbit. Okay, we copy. Thank you. Looks like it's a little, it's a little cloudy out here, Sally. It's a good thing the Sir AC is in that. And we can hear it crank up on the board. Okay, stand by. Okay, we see fan A on, and we'd like you to take Bravo. As Columbia landed the second time, the circle was complete. A new generation of space travel had begun.
when Space Shuttle 3 left the launch pad, it carried an experiment prepared by 18-year-old Todd Nelson of Rose Creek, Minnesota. An experiment to study the effects of weightlessness on insects in space. It's called the Shuttle Student Involvement Project and includes NASA, the National Science Teachers Association, and industry sponsors who help transform winning proposals into flight experiments. Since this first flight, young people in high schools around the country have developed and flown a variety of experiments, ranging from medical projects to the study of zero gravity on an ant colony. They are setting an example for others who may be encouraged to pursue careers in science and engineering, something that ultimately can be translated into technological leadership for the U.S. Twelve weeks passed. Then, astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield piloted Columbia on its fourth and final test flight. The spacecraft's performance made it possible to certify the space transportation system a fully operational carrier. As they landed on July 4th, the crew was greeted by President and Mrs. Reagan. first operational flight. Two commercial communications satellites were hauled into orbit, one for satellite business systems and one for Telesat of Canada. Their deployment was a complete success. Did you get it? You don't have it, obviously. I got it. Space Shuttle 6 was the second operational mission and Flight 1 for Challenger, this country's newest spacecraft. After launching a 5,000-pound tracking and data relay satellite from the payload bay, mission specialist astronauts Story Musgrave and Donald Peterson became the first Americans in nine years to walk in space, a practice needed for satellite repair work. Rotate around to get it on the right side. Up here where it says tape on the left hand door. Yeah. Mission 7 carried a crew of five into space, including America's first woman astronaut, Sally Ride. Main engine start. Main engine start and ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of STS 7 and America's first woman astronaut. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. She and mission specialists John Fabian and Norm Thagard deployed a pair of communication satellites for Canada and Indonesia. Roger that, looks great. Shuttles 1 and 2 were now operational, with the addition of a third orbiter, Discoverer, to the fleet, and with literally dozens of astronauts in training at any given time, this new space transportation system would begin delivering in earnest and with increasing frequency. Seventeen shuttle missions were flown in the next two and a half years. Here's some of the highlights. This is the first use of the Manned Maneuvering Unit or MMU on Flight 41B. Okay, here we go. Well, that may have been one small step for Neil, but it's a heck of a big leap for me. Copy that, Bruce. Thank you. The objective of the mission was to test equipment and procedures for the next flight when an ailing solar satellite would be retrieved using the shuttle, repaired in the payload bay, then returned to orbit. On the next mission, STS-41C, astronaut George Nelson again used the MMU, this time to reach the Solar Max, an ailing scientific satellite launched specifically to study the sun during a very active period only occurring one year out of 11.
Nelson was having trouble docking with the satellite. And his attempts were causing it to wobble. His MMU fuel was also getting low, so he had to return to the shuttle. SolarMax would be retrieved using the robot arm. But the satellite was wobbling too much to be grappled that way either. SolarMax mission controllers would have to stabilize it first. Challenger Houston sending by through Yargity. We've got it, and uh, we're in the process of putting in the FSF. Outstanding! Repairs could now begin. SolarMax had two faulty systems needing fixing. First order of business was to change out the attitude control system. Next came repair of the main electronics box on one of the prime experiments. Ground controllers then checked out the satellite to make sure everything was working properly. Then it was redeployed to continue its mission. On mission 51A, the objective was to retrieve two inactive satellites, then return them to Earth in Shuttle's cargo bay for repair back home. A newly developed Stinger device allowed astronauts to dock with the satellite so they could stop it spinning. Stop, 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 stop. stop the clock. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. Then the robot arm could bring both astronaut and satellite safely into the payload bay. There, a coupling device that the arm could grapple would be attached to the satellite, keeping it stationary during berthing. But the A-frame didn't fit. There was an obstruction on the satellite. Plan B was put into effect immediately. An astronaut would hold the satellite while another secured it in place. For the second stowing, the astronaut held the satellite from the end of the robot arm using a space version of a cherry picker called a manipulator foot restraint. Houston Discovery. Discovery, Houston. Roger, we have two satellites latched in the bay. Roger, that uh, gave us a big cheer down here. Missions 41B, 41C, and 51A proved that equipment, procedures, and tools for docking with satellites and repairing them in orbit worked correctly. It could be done. In addition, satellites never intended to be returned to Earth were in shuttle's cargo bay to be fixed and relaunched in the future. So, when yet another satellite malfunctioned, it gave NASA just one more chance to demonstrate its flexibility. 51I's mission was to repair a satellite antenna, essential for communication with the ground. Then redeploy it to a position where it could reach a higher orbit. Okay, Omni, deploy, fire. Omni, fire, here she comes, looking good. Looking good, buddy. All right. To accomplish this, a spin-up bar was attached so the astronaut could get a good grip. Okay, we copy. That's great work, everybody. I can still see the timers blinking. Go to work. Yeah, I do too. While a number of shuttle missions focused on satellite operations, other missions focused exclusively on scientific research. A European-built space lab module fits in shuttle's payload bay, 
allowing as many as 100 experiments to be operated for up to 10 days, 24 hours a day. Life science research is a major area of space lab experimentation. Discovering the exact triggering mechanism for space adaptation syndrome, like seasickness on Earth, is crucial to finding a remedy. Understanding the effect exercise has on the human body in the zero-g environment is also important. 24 monkeys were studied on board Space Lab Mission 51B. From the altitude at which shuttle orbits Earth, very accurate observations of the sun and astronomical objects can be made. This is the Aurora Australis as seen from space. The most unique aspect of Space Lab is the ability to provide scientists back on Earth the result of their experiment as it happens. As the mission unfolds, data can be analyzed and adjustments can be made. Many different fields of scientific research can be accommodated in Space Lab. Even gardening. Teacher in space, uh, Ellison on Azuka, and payload specialist Greg Jarvis. The tragic Six loss miles. of shuttle mission 51L on January 28, 1986, will be remembered by Americans for many years to come. After the disaster, NASA immediately began rebuilding the space program. The faulty solid rocket booster that caused the explosion was redesigned and retested. Although no problems were found with the main engines, they were retested and certified for flight during the almost three-year period the space program was grounded. flight crew was named and began training. One of the other shuttles in NASA's fleet was prepared for flight and construction began on a new space shuttle, replacing the one lost on Mission 51L. Director, uh, I have pulled the technical community and you will have our consensus to proceed with this launch. Good luck and Godspeed. On September 29, 1988, NASA was ready to return to space. Auto sequence start, discoveries four redundant computers have assumed. T minus 23 seconds and counting the SRB nozzle profile. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We're go for main engine start. Seven, six. We have main engine start. Three, two, one, zero, and lift off. Lift off. Americans return to space. Discovery clears the tower. Roger roll, Discovery. Pilot Richard Covey describes the ride up. Whether you have flown aboard the shuttle before or not, you are never really quite ready for the launch experience. Emotions, adrenaline, sight, sound, and motion all well together in an overwhelming bond. Your body tells you that something very powerful is propelling you and leaves no doubt that you are going somewhere very fast. As we pass through the region of maximum dynamic pressure, the seconds seem to move ever so slowly. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go. 
Discovery giving a go at throttle up. Three engines at 104 percent. The solid rocket motors worked superbly. The long, hard work of the redesign and test teams had paid off in a perfect launch. Those motors burn for two minutes, but it takes another six and a half minutes to achieve orbital velocity. The Discovery's liquid fuel engines provided the additional push required to accelerate to a speed of five miles a second and an altitude of 160 nautical miles. In that orbit, we would see 16 sunrises and sunsets a day for the next four days, traveling over one and two thirds million miles. Three engines still running 104%. 5,600 feet per second velocity, 31.8 nautical miles, altitude, downrange distance, 38 nautical miles. Main order of business on STS-26, put into orbit a second tracking and data relay satellite, originally planned for deployment on the lost 51L mission. Eventually, three satellites in the TDRA system will allow continuous communication between shuttles and the ground. Rise and shine, boys. Time to start doing that shuttle shuffle. You know what I mean? Hey, here's a little song coming from the billions of us to the five of you. Rick, start them off, baby. The Hawkster to you. <laughs> Give her the gas and look at this baby go. H-A-R! Are you awake yet? B-E-Y! Why? Because it's time to eat breakfast from a toothpaste tube. Well, we can take her up high and we can bring her down low. The only thing we can't do is order pizza to go. We orbit round, round, orbit round, we orbit round. Commander Fred Halk describes the ride down. At about 300 feet, Dick Covey lowered the landing gear. The gear down and locked. The report from Mission Control. Rotating the nose down, standing by for nose gear and touchdown. <laughs> 
with only moderate braking, we stopped after about 7,500 feet of ground roll. Wheel stop. Roger, wheel stop, Discovery. Welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. Thanks a lot. After completing the post-landing checks, we were met at the bottom of the steps by Vice President Bush, NASA Administrator Dr. Jim Fletcher, and the head of the Office of Space Flight, Rear Admiral Dick Truly. We knew that the smiles on their faces reflected the mood of the NASA team. We'd accomplished the mission's objectives. We'd returned Americans to space. Now, NASA is ready to embark on the next logical step, a permanent presence in space space station space station development work has been going on for many years a shuttle flight even tested possible construction materials and procedures contracts have now been let for actual construction the structure will include a platform for earth observation instruments and observatory servicing facility for maintenance and repair of satellites scientific laboratory, product development facility, and crew quarters. The space program in general, and the shuttle program in particular, have gone a long way to help our country recapture its spirit of vitality and confidence. The pioneer spirit still flourishes in America. In the future, as in the past, our freedom, independence, and national well-being will be tied to new achievements, new discoveries, and pushing back new frontiers. We must look aggressively to the future by demonstrating the potential of the shuttle and establishing a more permanent presence in space. <laughs>